Hi, I'm Bill Boyle with HBO. I'm Director of Employee Health and Fitness, and I'm here with Tara Healy, who is the Director of Mindfulness-Based Learning for Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare. And we're going to talk today a little bit about mindfulness and what that means. So, Tara, yes. can you tell us a little bit about mindfulness? What is the effectiveness of it? Why would we do this? What would we expect from it if yeah. you start sure. mindfulness? So let me first define it. So mindfulness essentially is a quality of mind that is awake and that is aware and that is alert and that knows it. And sometimes it's helpful to understand the opposite. So the opposite would be when you're lost in thought, let's say. And have you ever had a moment, Bill, where you're lost in thought and all of a sudden you wake up and go, whoa, where was I? Sure. So that's the opposite. So when you're lost in thought, you are in fact lost in thought. And when you wake up, that's a moment where you are present, you're awake, you're aware, and you know it. And that's really the moment where you are now, you're no longer hijacked by thought. So you have a more conscious choice over how you engage with the world. So, you know, in terms of speech and action, there's more attention, more awareness. But it is a form of meditation, <clears throat> correct? Um, well, mindfulness is the quality of mind that's awake, aware, and alert, and meditation is the practice we employ on a regular basis in order to cultivate that quality of being awake and aware. It's kind of like um, the analogy that I like to use is exercise. So if you want to have a strong and flexible body, you can't just think about it. You have to actually pick an exercise and engage in it a certain amount of time for a certain amount of days a week in order to have that strong and flexible body. And it's the same with being more wakeful and less lost in mind wandering and thought. So if we want to have an attention, we want to have a mind that has greater focus and concentration, we need to employ a meditative practice. So how would one start? How do you jump into it with two feet and have uh, you know five minutes a day or ten minutes a day seven <clears throat> days a week what's the best so way to get started I what I would recommend is to really start small so you could start with as little as three minutes a day and maybe you know three or four days a week as a way to kind of sample it because for most of us it doesn't feel that comfortable to have the usual distractions of our lives removed and just to be still and so partly it's getting used to being still. And um, in meditation, you are actually using an object such as the breath so that your attention can land on it. Otherwise, the attention can just really wander. So for instance, three or four days a week for you know three or 10 or 20 minutes, but I say start small. Um, you sit down and you notice the breath coming in and coming out. Now thoughts will come in, and meditation is not about stopping thought. It's a really big misconception. And so thoughts will come in and thoughts will go out, and you just leave them be. The th as soon as you notice you're in a thought, you release the thought and you return your attention to the breath. So wherever you notice it most in the body, the breath coming in, the breath going out. So starting out, should you set aside <clears throat> three minutes at nine o'clock each morning, or do you do it when you have a break in your emails and you say, I'm gonna do it now? When should you begin? Well, we lead pretty busy lives, so I say to most people, in order to build a habit, it's great to do it at the same time every day, but it's not always realistic. And if you're gonna start, let's say for two weeks, you say, okay, every day I'm gonna do the three minute meditation. And um, you could start in the morning. You could do the three minutes once you get into work. I mean, some people who find it really, really difficult to find the time will sit in their cars or they'll listen on the subway and do the guided meditation while they're sitting on the subway. So wherever you can fit it in is usually how I answer that. A few times that I've started to try to meditate, yes. you mentioned mind wandering. Right. So many thoughts come in to right. play, the emails yeah. I have to respond to, the phone calls I have to make, and trying to sit still and think about my yeah. breathing, focus on my breathing, uh, becomes overwhelming mm -hmm. very quickly, and mm -hmm. I realize I really should not take the time to do this, I've got to get to the emails. Right, right. Uh, so what's the best way to really get beyond that? 
Well, I think, you know, um, I, I would answer your question by saying that there is a, there's a misconception that when we practice meditation, the goal is to actually stop thought. So if you could enter meditation and let go of that goal, because the goal is not about to stop thought. In fact, um, it's, it's close to impossible to stop thought. And if you think you need to stop your thought, then you will be arguing with yourself throughout the entire meditation practice. So the idea is that when you find that you've engaged a story, a rumination, a memory, a thought, you just simply release it. And a technique that's really helpful is just simply to label it. Ah, that moment you wake up that I talked about earlier, where you wake up from the trance of thought and go, oh, whoa, where was I? Release the thought and then return your attention to the breath. Because in a sense, what we're doing with meditation is we are learning to steady the mind by coming back over and over again to our chosen object. It's like if you wanted a strong bicep, you'd have to do a lot of repetitions against the resistance of the weight in order to build that bicep. So in other words, what we're doing with this is that we're coming back over and over again, the resistance instead of a weight being the thinking mind. So we see we've gone into thought, we just come back. By doing that repeatedly, you are learning to steady your mind. And so uh, what I would say, Bill, is that the thoughts are not a problem unless you make them one. They are going to happen. So the goal isn't to just focus on your breathing and respiration, your pulse rate. <clears throat> that is not the goal. The goal is to steady the mind. And so what you are coming back to over and over again is your breath. That's your, you, you need something to help counter the strong force of distraction in the mind. It, especially as a new meditator, it's helpful to have an object to counter the strong force of distraction. And so eventually, you know, as you become practiced with this, you don't have to, you won't need an object. But initially you do. It also, not only does it help counter the strong force of distraction, it helps you see the speed at which your mind is actually moving. And a lot of people are, are really surprised by how busy their mind is. Well, it seems like the quieter you keep your body, <clears throat> the faster your mind races, at least, at least for me. And yeah, well, we are so busy in our lives and there are so many distractions and some of them are, you know, we're feeding into those distractions that when we put them down and we say, okay, I'm going to practice meditation and I'm going to set aside three minutes and I'm going to use my breath as the anchor and the mind has other ideas. So it will bring in memory and it'll bring in planning, thoughts about the future, regrets, and when you're formally practicing, just know that's part of it. When you see it, just release it and return to the... You can think of meditation as like a calibration of the mind. You're calibrating the mind, you're steadying the mind, so that mindfulness, this quality of being awake and aware, can do its job more effectively. It works better on a steady platform. How does that translate into being more effective on the job or in life? Essentially, what we're doing is we are cultivating more focus and concentration um, so that we can employ that concentrated focused mind in the service of our lives. So for instance, if you're in an interaction with somebody and um, they are really pushing your buttons in some way, the more you're practicing with noticing your own habits, patterns, and tendencies, the less likely you are to be reactive with that person and say or do something that's not so skillful. So an example of where it could be helpful is if you're in a conversation with someone. So let's say you have a little bit of practice behind. You're getting a little bit of steadiness with your attention, becoming more aware of your thoughts and body sensations. And you're with that coworker who really triggers you, pushes your buttons. But now you're starting to see it through this lens of awareness rather than through a lens of reactivity and habit. And so what happens ultimately is you start to increase that gap between impulse and action so that you can use a more skillful tone, more skillful words with that person so that you're less reactive and more responsive. More thoughtful. More thoughtful, yeah. And less regret. Ultimately, how much time would you put into this practice or you know, how frequently do you do it? How much time per week are you putting in, into the uh, program? Yeah. So um, 
the way that I would answer that is, because people will often ask, when am I going to get some results? You know, when am I going to start to see something? And this practice ultimately re requires trust, patience, and discipline. And the amount of practice that you put in is in direct proportion to the benefit. So if you practice a little bit, you are likely to see a little bit of benefit. And when I say benefit, I mean that ultimately you have a bit more ease in how you relate to and engage with your life, all aspects of your life, how you deal with traffic, how you deal with other people, how you deal with family members. So that's what this practice is about, is giving you more skill in how you engage with the world in general, allowing it to really inform your life. Um, and, and it also is, cultivates compassion and kindness, not only for yourself, but, but also for others. So I would say the practice and the benefits are going to be in direct proportion. If you practice a lot, you'll start to see a lot from that. Where do you do your practices? Are you doing it behind the wheel? Uh, yeah, so, you, yeah. Where, where's the best place to, to No, to practice? great question. There's two kinds of practice. There's formal and informal. So formal practice is where you say, okay, I'm going to give this a shot. So for the next month, I am going to do the three-minute practice, the three-minute guided practice, um, four or five days a week. And then you might say the next week, week two of your one month, maybe you'll up it and do 10 minutes four days a week. And then there's something called informal practice. And informal practice is where you're basically bringing the practice into the service of your life in all ways. So for instance, you're waiting in line and you catch yourself ruminating and just thinking. That, the moment you catch that is a moment to just notice where you are and just come into the present moment and you're just aware of where you are. Um, you go home and you go out for a walk and you notice that you're rehashing the day. The minute you notice you're rehashing the day, see if you can just for a moment just release that story and come into where the moment you're in. You know, see the blue sky, feel the breeze. And what I would also say, Bill, is qualitatively in that moment, notice the difference between being lost and waking up. Because this practice is empirical in nature. And so you really want to test for yourself, what do you notice when you're lost in thought and when you wake up? What's the difference for you? So be like a scientist and you are the subject as well. Well, when, you, you know, when you're speaking and we're talking <laughs> about mindfulness, I find myself at times realizing how far off your, your conversation you can go. Yes, uh, yeah. So I guess that's what you're talking about a bit yeah. throughout the day. Yes, I mean, if you're engaging with another person and you're planning dinner, I mean, you're not really with them and they tend to know it. We get it when someone's not with us. We get it. And it impacts us because if I'm talking to you but I know that you're drifting and you're not really there, I'm not inclined to continue, or I'm not inclined to tell you something that actually might be really important work-wise. Right. Just not inclined to do it. But if you're there with me, and I know it, and we know it, then I'm probably going to hang in there with you, and I'm going to give you more information than maybe I otherwise would have. When you're doing your practice, are there particular positions you should be in physically? Should you be lying down? Should you be sitting, standing? Yeah, yeah. What is the best way to, it's, to be? Well, there's a few different postures for meditation. So there's sitting meditation, there's walking meditation, um, there's standing meditation. So, you, you know, there's a few different ways to do it. Um, it's fine to do sitting meditation in a chair just like we're in. It's, you know, it, you don't really need special equipment. Um, you don't even really need necessarily a special place to be, although I do recommend if you're new to practice, ideally to find a place that is somewhat quiet. Uh, oftentimes people with families and kids and loud households Very will difficult. say, you know what, before I get into work, I'll just sit in my car. Or I will, you know, put the three minute in or the 10 minute in uh, when I'm on the train and I just will quietly practice then. It's just kind of rotating your consciousness from being awake to, from being asleep to now being awake. Mindfulness is um, a concentration and a wisdom practice. So it would be the idea with mindfulness meditation is you are learning to steady your mind so that you can see with greater clarity how things actually are. Not how you wish they were or how you think they should be, but to really see how things actually are and to really understand the changing nature of everything. 
Do you find people kind of, uh, or people feel afraid when they start meditating? Do they, does this put them off a little bit? Um, it, it, it can. I mean, uh, you know, it's very common to start meditating and to feel some anxiety, but it's normal. It's not, you know, I really want to emphasize that it's not like you're doing it wrong because you're feeling anxious. If you have a preconceived idea that you're supposed to be all zen-like and calm, that's going to create a problem for you. So I say, you know, let that idea go and have some expectation that you may have anxiety. You may have uh, other emotions that are not so pleasant surface. And the idea with this practice is we are actually turning toward it, not away from it. We are turning toward it as a way of understanding its nature. That it has, you know, for instance, I mean, anger is a great energy to work with. When we react from an angry place, uh, we often feel some regret. But when we can feel the anger arising in us because we've been practicing working with our thoughts and with our body, we can actually use the energy of the anger to help us respond more skillfully in the world. You talked a little bit about handling distractions. Mm -hmm. and we live in big cities now yes. and everybody's running around all the time. Things are happening, phones are ringing, cell phones are buzzing. Right. How do you yeah. meditate? How do you handle being mindful through all those distractions? Well, meditation practice is, you know, it's one of those things that's simple but not easy. So I would say ultimately, you know, ideally if you can find some quiet places, that is going to be helpful. But as you say, it's not always realistic. And so, for instance, let's say you are meditating at work and, uh, you know, you start to hear an ambulance go by and it's interrupting you. Uh, what I would do is whenever you feel pulled by a sound or even a body sensation, what you want to do is let go of the object. Let's say we're using breath and let your attention follow and track that sound. Let's stay with that sound for a bit. It would be true at home, you know, if, if there are kids running and dogs barking in the other room. It doesn't really have to be an interruption. It could be built in as an expectation that, you know, this is, this is my life and this is what I'm dealing with. And when you hear those sounds, let your attention release the breath and go to that sound. Hang in there with it for a little bit and just notice it. Notice that what's happening. You don't have to create stories about it, so you want to be careful to not create stories about it. Let be with the sound, come back to the breath. You get pulled again by a muscle cramp. So it's not just distraction in terms of sound, but it can also be a uh, body, an itch, a muscle cramp. So the mind-body connection, mm -hmm. can you speak a little bit about that? Are there health benefits, long-term health benefits, say on blood pressure or uh, cholesterol, anything along those lines? So there's, there's a lot of promising benefits right now. Um, and really, this is a practice that has been studied for over 30 years. But, but really, in the last probably five to seven, we're seeing the, um, a real big uptick in the amount of research that's going into this. But some of the benefits include uh, a decreased inflammation. Um, people have been coming off anti-anxiety drugs. Uh, or being able to wean off anti-anxiety drugs, uh, lowering of blood pressure, um, a strengthening of the immune system, and just an overall sense of well-being. So I would say that the science is very is new, um, but the benefits are, are promising. In fact, a lot of the early studies were done with body pain, with the idea that one could be physically in pain but they're able to relate to it in a way that really doesn't put them off balance. You know, so they have the physical pain, but they're now they're relating to it through this lens of mindful awareness. So they're seeing it absent of stories about it. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the effects on, on other areas of your mind. Creativity, for example. We are a very creative yeah. company. Yes. And how does mindfulness affect creativeness? Do we increase it or decrease it or how does that, yeah. that all work? I mean I can't say of any particular studies that I know of that that would point to the creativity but what I can say is that what we're doing ultimately is creating more space and more steadiness for creativity concentration focus for so you're creating more space in the mind so it makes sense that you would have more room for creative ideas to flow in
Does that, does yeah. that help? Yeah. Thank you very much.